Psalm 98 uh, through uh, 15 through 12. Um, Nina and Rana has taught me a lot about myself. I have gained a lot of experience in many healthcare fields and also have achieved my CPR license, my CNA license, and first aid. I was also able to go to Brown University last summer and do a program um, called the Weekend Life for Medical Students. Um, after after um, high school, I plan to go to CSRI for two years because they're having this um, you know, two-year um, free for associate's degree, and then transfer to RIP to get my BSM and become an RN. But I'm not going to stop there. <laughs> I'm also going to get um, go back to school, get a master's degree, and become a nurse practitioner and dermatologist. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my project real quick. So the topic of my project is postpartum depression in African-American women. Um, my target audience was healthcare professionals, African-American women, and um, the Rhino community, because I feel like it's really important to talk about this since there's not a lot of information going around about it. My learning stretch was to find out things that caused African-American women to have postpartum depression, and also try to use my knowledge of what I found out about it and um, to bring awareness to it. <laughs> my thesis was made by a lot of research I did, which was a lot, <laughs> a lot of research, and I came up with a thesis of how low socioeconomic status of culture and low um, social support um, leaves African American women being higher with um, postpartum depression than other races. Okay, I'm gonna talk about many um, postpartum disorders that happen um, after birth that affect African-American women. Not, after, well, not only African-American women, but women in general. Um, when it comes to pregnancy or after birth, 19.4% um, um, of women suffer with sadness um, isolation, fear, um, you know, depression. Um, but pe um, health professionals see this as what well, they call it the baby blues, and it's basically common for women after birth to feel that way, and that's because of um, an enzyme called mono monomin. I'm gonna butcher this, but mono monomin exodus. It's an enzyme, and when the estrogen is really low, it comes into play and it just increases the depression in, in women. When it comes to baby blues, the symptoms are sadness, irritation, um, they're dep um, depressed, they have headache, they're really tired. Um, when it comes, unlike the other postpartum um, disorders, um, postpartum depression is very, um, is acute. As people, I know some of y'all healthcare professionals know that acute means like it's short term, so it doesn't really last long. It lasts about two weeks. But if baby blues was to last longer than two weeks, then it'll be known as postpartum depression. <laughs> and postpartum depression is depression that happens after birth. It's mostly due to hormonal factors, um, not like getting enough, enough rest, and you know the um, factor of becoming a um, when it comes to postpartum depression, the symptoms include, you know, um, weight gain slash weight loss. Um, they always have mood swings. They are, I won't say they're paranoid, but they could be paranoid. Um, they're really sad. They're, like, they think about harming themselves. They always have negative thoughts. They might think about harming their kid as well, or go try to harm their kid. <laughs> but if postpartum depression is not treated, if it's not treated on time, it can lead to postpartum psychosis, which is really rare when it comes to women. It happens in two in 1,000 women, so it's really rare. Um, it includes um, hallucinations, paranoia, delusions, organization. It just leaves them in a state of not feeling like 
they feel like they're doing something good. They might like in some cases they might feel like they're doing something good for the child, like saving them for somebody else. But in reality, it's just all in their head. Like they feel like they have to save their kid. Um, when it when it comes to postpartum disorders, postpartum disorders happen due to hormones. Um, those hormones are called estrogen and testosterone. Or testosterone? Progesterone. Yeah, I was going to. So, progesterone. Um, those two hormones, the reason why those two hormones um, affect you know, people after pregnancy is because when a person gives birth, it basically drops. Those two hormones drop. And it leaves the woman in a state of feeling very, very emotional. Which leads them, which, that's why after pregnancy, they'll be like, they might see them crying more, or, you know, not, maybe they not even want to touch their kid more, or, you know what I mean? Like, that's, those emotions are coming based on those two um, um, hormones. Um, there's, there's still being research being done to see if that is really um, the only cause of, you know, postpartum disorders, but for right now, it's just hormones. Um, I also want to talk about the largest state that has um, postpartum depression, which is Arkansas, which has 24, I'm going to say 24, 24.4% of women of having um, PPD. And this is because they have, um, they have a high rate of teen births. They also have, they also have, <laughs> sorry. They also have, they have a high rate of teen births. And when it comes to the third trimester of pregnancy, they are really low when it comes to checking up on the mom, make sure that, you know, they're getting all the care they need. And when it comes to screening, they don't really check up to see, like, make sure that they get enough screening. So they kind of lacking in the department of making sure that the mom is good after birth. Risk factors when it comes to I'm gonna just, this one I wanna talk about risk factors gonna be more towards African American women than all women in particular. When it comes to risk factors, um, one risk factor is that African American mothers are very, how do I say this? They're, they're not able to take care of themselves. Well, they're able to take care of themselves, but they don't have that willpower to take care of themselves. Um, they, I had, when I was doing my, some of my research, I saw that some, women would state that when it came to like dealing with the postpartum they like they will want it they know they're supposed to like do something like let's say take a shower like i'm not supposed to take a shower you know what i mean i'm supposed to take a shower in the morning but the, they won't feel that energy to like do anything even if their kid was crying they would have that energy to say i want to pick up my child this one by themselves they're like they're in this bubble they don't they won't be in this bubble by themselves but it's not really them who want to be by themselves, more like the depression that's taking over them when they're by themselves. Another risk factor is affordable child childhood care, um, low social um, low social support, um, stress, which I feel is common when it comes to um, pregnancy, and um, access to me um, medical care. When it comes to African American women, they are they're low. Their percentage are low compared to other races. There's like 40, 44% of low income women will um, will get postpartum depression, while 38% of them are new mothers. Well, I always been the part about new mothers because of the oxidosis thing, but like at the same time, you know, that's, that's kind of bad how they're really high. Um, when it comes to low social support, um, African American women, women have, uh, they don't, they have low support. I read in my research that sometimes when it comes to them finding um, support, they had to like kind of reach out more to get support from their peers. Also, I found out that when it comes to so social support, even though it's low in their community, even if they get a little bit of it, it's really beneficial to their treatment. It could really do a big, like, it could really do something big in the outcome of postpartum depression. Um, tragic life events also could affect them, like um, a difficult pregnancy slash delivery, 
um, discrimination or racism, whether it's direct or indirect. And I want to explain a little bit about indirect and um, um, direct. Direct is more if I was to tell you like something racist or prejudiced, that's you expressing it, expressing it firsthand. Non-direct is expressing it like on social media or your friends telling you about what happened or you know you see it on TV. Those all can affect um, African American women having to be. Also, genetics could also affect it because if a mom has any type of postpartum um, disorders while she's pregnant or even in her past before she's pregnant, she could, when she gives birth, she could, um, her child or her offspring could have um, depression. If it's a female, she might have, you know, depression after birth. If it's a male, she might just have, you know, depression, but that could also be a factor. Now I'm gonna talk about socioeconomic status because this is one thing that is very, very, um, good, like, I was like, oh, cru crucial, crucial, I, I wish I said that. Crucial. Really crucial when it comes to um, African American women and their, um, their well-being. Because when it comes to, especially not just African, like we're gonna break this down, not just African women in general, because not everyone has low income, not everyone has, you know, some, some African women are high income, they have high income, but when it comes to a low income woman, um, they tend to, because they don't have, you know, the correct, don't have the money for, um, for um, Medicare, they don't have the money for, not the money, but they, they probably don't have that opportunity to, like, finish high school or go to college. They, like, if they had a kid early, you know, those stuff could affect them and put them in that status. But I didn't explain what social economic status is about right now. The social economic status is basically what people are put in, put under. Like we have the high income, we have the low incomes, we have the middle incomes, we have the poor. And they place these people under this um these um, statuses to what well, I would say to be, like to better organize everyone. Be like, okay, this is you know this is why there's people in this particular way. This is why there's people in this particular way. Um. Also, when it comes to socioeconomic status, um, it can also be about where they live. It's not only just about their income. Like, if you live in an urban area, they are, they can, you know, sorry, <laughs> they can, they have a, they can have a higher risk of having um, postpartum depression. Um, I want to tell you guys a little bit about, about my graph to go along to support socioeconomic status, how that benefits African women, African American women. Okay, as you can see, when it comes to income, the twenty people who make twenty six thousand and lower, which is twenty five percent of um, women, they they are the highest out of you know out of the out of the other group. People who make sixty seven thousand and higher, um, they you know they are less than they're less than the other um, people who have who have their who have um, lower income. When it comes to race, um, twenty four point nine percent of Black women, as we can see, are higher than um, other races or like Spanish or you know Caribbean, Caribbean or everything, <laughs> then white people who are at five, fifteen point four percent. When it comes to age, people who are um, twenty years or younger are tend to have a higher percentage than people who are, you know, older. And when it comes to prenatal factors, which are factors that happen after birth, um, people who have history of depression tend to have a higher percentage. So overall, this graph basically explains that African American women, which is the highest percentage out of all other other races, and they have an income of twenty six thousand or lower, and they are the ages of tw um, twenty and below. So that means like mid to late teen pregnancies around there, and have history of depression. 
And I also count um, unplanned pregnancy because that's also tied to will have a greater um, risk of pe having postpartum depression than others. So overall, it's because the African American women are more susceptible to having postpartum depression due to income, their age, and depression, and if they plan pre they had they had a planned pregnancy or not. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about treatment. When it comes to treating PPD, there's a thing called an Edinburgh scale, which I handed you guys, handed out to you guys. Um, the end, the Edinburgh scale is basically a it's it's a screening, but when I think of a screening, I always think of like you know like X-rays and stuff, but it's not like X-ray. It's more like I'll say more like the Edinburgh questionnaire. <laughs> it basically tells tells you questions about yourself to see how you are feeling. And when I was doing um, some of my research, I found out that they ask personal questions when it comes to the ending first scale, like if the person is suicidal and how they plan out to go with it, because that could also that could also help them better understand how how serious their postpartum is. Also, group therapy is also good when it comes to treating um, postpartum depression, especially African American women, because as I said before, African American women have low social support. So if they go into a group of women who are, not say are like them, but you know, have a sis, um, similar situation as them, they won't feel as if they're the only person to be suffering that by themselves, which I feel makes, you know, makes them more, I feel, it makes them more, prone to PPDs in a sense. And also, I feel like if they're able to go to group therapy and know that they're not the only people who are suffering from postpartum depression, they'll be able to, you know, be able to talk to the health professionals better about the situation or their friends about their situation and get the best treatment they can because now they feel more confident to go to the healthcare professionals and tell them about their situation. Also, they use um, they can also use medication for treatment, which is you know the typical antidepressants, which is used for um, people who have depression. And they also use mother and infant um, psychotherapy, which is basically um, if they see like the mom and the child are not having the type of bond that they need to have, they will have kind. Of, it's not like group therapy, but except with just your child and the infant. They'll try to bring it all, bring them together, and build that relationship that they need to have. Um, for my interview, I interviewed Elizabeth Howard at Women Infants. Um, she was very nice. She, I interviewed interviewed her um, on the phone, and all I can say is. I think I'm a good teacher <laughs> because when I was telling her about my information, she was like, oh, I didn't know about, a lot about that. It's crazy how you know about that. And I was like, oh, hmm, I feel, it feels good. <laughs> it feels good to educate you about it. So when it came to my thing, she's the one who taught me more about the screening process uh, when, it, when it comes to detecting PPD because I know about the screening process, but I didn't really know a lot. Like they will ask serious questions like, what they'll do if they are suicidal, or like how they plan to go out with it. I wasn't expecting them to ask them that kind of questions, but she told me that's what they asked. And I was like, oh, that's really surprising. I had a, I had a fun time interviewing her. Um, I showed the end of the scale again, because that's what we talked about in my interview. When it came to field work, I did field, I had two pieces to my field work. I had a field work with a midwife at Women and Infants. Um, her name is Stephanie Michelle. She basically, I went, I met her at Women and Infants near like Zion Cafe and everything, and she basically told me about how she felt that healthcare professionals could 